Well, welcome. Uh, I'm Andrew Foster, if you weren't here last time. So this is our second environment and, and uh, uh, development seminar, and I'm delighted to invite back uh, one of my former students, uh, Yosalat, uh, who's now at Portagus, although I think he's had, what, six jobs since he left here in 2006. Um, so yeah, he's worked in a, a nonprofit, uh, a, a university, a postdoc. Yeah, so uh, he's, uh, he's seen, seen a lot. Um, uh, he reminded me that, uh, that uh, I first got him started doing remote sensing back when he was a graduate student. He was taking uh, actual transparencies of satellite images and scanning them and digitizing them. So the technology has gotten better and, uh, and so that's, that's nice to see. Um, but uh, he has a you know, broad set of interests. Uh, his, uh, his thesis work was looking at Kenya and looking at sort of, uh, communication between the urban and rural areas. He's uh, done a, a lot of work on Roma kids, uh, potential interest in education and so forth. Uh, but uh, today he's going to talk to us appropriately about the environment and pick about forest cover. So uh, go ahead. Yes. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Andrew. So, yeah, so I, I got my PhD uh, in, here in 2005, defended in 2005. Uh, Andrew Foster was my, my advisor, and indeed since then uh, I had a postdoc at, uh, at, at Harvard, and I went to UCAM, the University of Quebec in, in, in Montreal. Uh, spent also some time at the University in the Netherlands, helping set up their broad program in, in Africa. Uh, then moved to the World Bank, uh, and I'm now the, at a foundation. So I think that so the lesson I think here is that. Uh, you can certainly find a job with a Brown PhD, but you, can, <laughs> but you can't actually hold one. <laughs> so, um, today's talk um, is about cash for carbon, a randomized controlled trial of payments for ecosystem services to reduce deforestation. It's joint work. Uh, you see the, the colleagues, Seema at Northwestern, Eric at Stanford, and, and Charlotte at the Carnegie uh, Institution. This work has been in the making for, for, a, long, for a long time. Uh, and and as I, I, I had a chance to uh, sit down with some of the graduate students today. And, and you know, if you want to uh, uh, get tenure in your, in your first job, my advice is, is not to do these types of things uh, <laughs> uh, and, and to be, be a bit more strategic. Um, I think you would agree. <laughs> uh, However, if you do want to do very many di different things, then I would you know, very much encourage you to, to, to take the path that, I, that I've been taking. Um, the actual experiment itself, the program was rolled out only a couple of years ago, in 2010. Um, and we finalized the data collection in 2014 and, and finalized the paper uh, just a few months ago. Um, that is actually the first time that I'm presenting it in, 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 in this format. Uh, SEMA has and presenting it elsewhere. Um, so let me just uh, move kind of fast forward a, a, a little bit uh, in light of both the audience who you are with an environmental background uh, and interest and, uh, and also for the sake of time, we have a little under, under an hour um, to just you know, give you a little bit of, 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 of background. So this is about a randomized experiment of a pest program in, in, in Uganda. Um, we worked in uh, 60 different uh, treatment villages where private forest owners were receiving small payments um, for a period of two years, essentially not to cut down, cut down their forest. There was a small reforestation component, but that was really quite, uh, quite marginal. In terms of kind of the overall, the overall policy question, which you know, I'm, I'm sure you're actually much more familiar with than, um, than I am, uh, there is you know, deforestation is a, is a is a huge environmental issue um, within kind of the environmental governance, particularly the Red Plus uh, that has been reinforced in the in the Paris Agreement last year. There's a focus on these types of systems. It calls explicitly for uh, also payments for results type systems to support this type of work. But there's very little kind of rigorous evidence on kind of does it work uh, these types of payment payment systems. And so this paper tries to contribute to this literature through this randomized controlled trial in, in, in Uganda. Um, we measure the impacts on tree cover by uh, high resolution satellite images. And, and we'll talk about that in, in much greater detail. And then also look at uh, some cost benefit analysis, uh, comparing the, uh, the, the benefits of averted, averted uh, 
uh, deforestation with the with the program called Stabay in the context, and you actually have to make quite a few assumptions along the way, and and we try to be very transparent about about those assumptions, uh, but in a long a range of assumptions uh, uh, that seem reasonable, the benefits uh, exceed the cost in, uh, in, in in this particular program. Uh, unlike actually many other uh, other types of programs that we highlight, and we talk a little bit about the economic and other outcomes uh, that we measure at the household level. So do we see as a result of this, of this PEST program, are households richer, are they healthier? Um, and how does their behavior also change towards the land that they manage? Uh, do we see a change in, in, in forest management, for example? Um, So I'll first talk a little bit about the, uh, the study design in more, in, in more detail, um, the various different data that we, that we had, the results, and then at the end, the, the cost-benefit analysis itself. So first, you know, where did it take place? Well, Uganda, where in Uganda? Um, in Western Uganda, and, and you, see that, you see that here, so here's the map of Uganda. And it was basically in two districts, in Western Uganda near Lake Albert, the Hoima district and, and Kibale. Um, Uganda, about an eighth of, of Uganda is covered by, by forest. Um, the majority of that is on private forest owners' uh, uh, lands, so not on government lands, but on uh, land owned by, by private forest owners. And the reason why we were working in that particular area um, is it's, it's not a coincidence. There was a the implementing NGO, and I'll talk a little bit about that in more detail later on, but the implementing NGO uh, is a uh, NGO that supports the chimp, chimpanzee population in, 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 in Uganda. Um, and they were interested in preserving a forest corridor between <coughs> two large chimp populations on, uh, that were in, 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 on government forest lands. Uh, and so, this was an area of Uganda. This is an area of Uganda. In, in that corridor, you have all these, these private forest owners. Uh, deforestation is, is is very high in Uganda in general, 2.7 percent per year, which uh, is apparently the third fastest rate of deforestation in, in the world. And it's even higher. You know, that's the average, and it's higher on 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 the lands of private forest owners. And so, as a result of that, the natural habitat of these chimpanzee populations are, uh, are disappearing, also raising kind of human wildlife uh, conflicts. And, and from that perspective, the implementing organization, the NGO, was interested in promoting uh, this, this, this pest program. Um, and so, what are some reasons for uh, uh, to deforest? At the baseline survey, and again, I'll talk about that in, 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 in more detail, about 85% uh, of respondents highlighted that they've been cutting trees in the three years prior to, to the baseline survey. Uh, and, and when we look at, at the reasons for cutting the trees, about 25% of the private or forest owners responded that they've been clearing land for cu cultivation. Uh, so that's a very common reason. And the majority actually uh, have been cutting trees to sell for, for, for timber. And just as a point for reference, uh, a large mature tree uh, in this part of Uganda sells for about 20 to 40 US dollars. And, and just to put that in, 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 in comparison, the payments that the program offered were 28, 28 US dollars uh, per hectare of uh, a forest. So it gives you a per point year. Per, per year. Yeah, per year. Uh, you know, so we could do a quiz now. We don't have time for it. Do you think that this program would work if I told you <laughs> that you know, it sells for this much and the payment is, is 28 US dollars a year? Uh, uh, Labor is costly. <laughs> An important slide, the project timeline. So let me just spend a little bit of time going through that with you. Um, so in here, at the top, 
you see the, the overall timeline and then the various, the various activities alongside it. Uh, so in, in 2010, uh, towards the end of 2010, we carried out, and we, I should say, uh, the, the, the data collection itself was done by Innovation for, for Poverty Action, which I'm sure many of you, many of you know. Uh, and, and so a, using uh, uh, satellite images, Landsat information, villages with uh, forests were identified, uh, and uh, then the uh, field officers visited each of these villages. They met with a knowledgeable forest owner and, and uh, kind of the village head and created lists of private forest owners. So for each of these villages. And then 280 villages that had natural forest still standing on private, on the lands of these PFOs, private forest owners, were, were identified. Um, we then, yes please, a question back. How many trees per hectare, and how long do they take to grow? How many trees per hectare? Uh, I don't know the answer, but I can give you the answer at the end in terms of the, the, the carbon stock uh, that was there. And how long do the trees take to mature? It, 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 it depends on the, uh, on, on the trees. At least uh, decades. At least decades. Um, if you want to sit down, you're most welcome. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Uh, the, and so we narrowed that list down from 280 to, uh, to 121, 121 villages. And so how did we do that? So we, and, and, and why? Well, an important reason was budgetary reasons. Uh, um, the, by taking, uh, removing villages that had few private forest owners, so we put a lower bound at six. Uh, we also put an upper bound at, at 25. And the reason was simply that the implementing NGO, CSWCT, this, the acronym for this uh, uh, organization, they had a fixed budget for the payment for the PEST system. And so if we were to work in villages with very many forest owners, uh, now from their perspective it would be fine, but it wouldn't add much statistical power. Uh, so we were looking just from the statistical power point of view in the, in the context of this experiment, we needed, because uh, the assignment uh, was at the village level, so we needed enough villages to give us sufficient statistical power. So we put this lower bound of six and this upper bound at 25, and then came to baseline uh, to a sample of, of 121 uh, sample villages. And that was in, in uh, 2011. Did you double check that the villages weren't systematically different in some other way by having a smaller number of private forest owners? Um, so they were, I mean, uh, yes, they were, they, were, they were smaller because they were f f for exactly that reason, yeah. So in terms of, uh, you know, the, uh, they, they excluded the many and they excluded the small. So they did, this is the middle range of villages. So in terms of external terms validity. Of size, but, is, but is it also, are they kind of systematically different in the sense that you, you have included a large number of ones that are kind of crop-producing economies and minimize the ones that are different sorts of economies. Uh, so we don't actually have that level uh, of, of, of detail on, on, on those villages. Um, and then um, a baseline survey was carried out in, in these 121 sample villages. Um, the survey took about an hour and a half to, uh, to conduct, so this was a one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one survey. Um, and then, a few months later, in the period from, from August uh, to December 2012, and also here you see the baseline satellite information was collected in that in the same period, and I'll, I'll go into more detail about the type of information that we, that we used. Um, public lotteries were organized. And so how were, how were these organized? Uh, we had divided the sample, so these 121 villages, uh, in groups per each of the seven sub-counties. Um, and then in each, in each sub-county, we created two, two <coughs> lists of villages, uh, tickets. And so these, each, no, a, a, an A and a B. 
and we ensured that A and B were balanced along four characteristics uh, that had been collected at the, at, at, at the baseline. Uh, so each of these tickets, so we had seven of them, seven times two, uh, se well, yeah, seven with A and B, uh, were, were, were balanced. And then public lotteries were held uh, with the representative of these sub-counties, where effectively they were asked, you know, close your eyes and, and, and please take, take from a, a, a bowl uh, the selection, is A going to be the treatment group or will B be the treatment group? Um, then, and, and perhaps one thing to note here, and we'll come back to that in, in, in the results section, the baseline satellite image, part of the results, uh, sorry, part of the, uh, uh, part of the baseline satellite information was collected uh, after these lotteries had taken place. Most of it was collected before, but because of the rainy season, so then they, the satellite goes over and has to collect multiple strips. Uh, and we had a contract with the satellite company that the um, maximum cloud coverage would be 15%. 15, 15 uh, and so they were simply not able, as a result of all the clouds in, in, in the sky for, peer, for months, to collect that information. So uh, the baseline for a few of the villages actually happened for the, for the satellite happened after, before the program start, but after uh, the, uh, the, the lottery took, took place. Um, actually, in some cases, they were after the program started. And that's, we used it as a robustness check. Uh, so in a way, you would expect that the program may have actually started there, uh, so that should reduce the effect size uh, for in, in those communities where the information was collected after the, the start of the baseline. Uh, then the organization implemented the project. Yes, please. I'm sorry, when, when you say public lottery, um, are you talking about a lottery where, you're not talking about an auction where you're trying to get the lowest price. You're just saying, are you control or are you treatment? Yes, yeah, yeah. As, as simple as literally, I mean, it was literally a bowl, uh, okay. and then yeah, with two choices. Uh, and that was repeated seven times for the different for the different sub yeah. uh, And the point of doing it publicly was so that people didn't feel like you were doing something sneaky. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and in fact, in, in, in my ex my own experience uh, in in, uh, in in other settings as well is that if you do it publicly, that uh, it creates much greater acceptance of of everything that you're doing. So there, I think there's a big value of of, of, of doing that. Uh, of course, it creates some risks, but um, then CSWCT, the implementing organization, offered contracts, visited the treatment villages, uh, and then said we have this PEST program. And I'll, I'll show you the, on, 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 on the next slide kind of the details of the, of the contract itself. Uh, and then there were monitors, as you see here. Uh, these were community monitors going around on bicycles uh, and for those who signed up to the contract would, would see if they were in compliance. Payments were made once per year for, for two years. Um, our end-line sa satellite images, uh, knowing our experience here at Baseline, how difficult it was to uh, collect satellite information that was, that was cloud-free, so to say. Uh, we erred on the cautious side and started collecting the end line satellite images kind of well before the end of this, this two-year program to make sure that, that we wouldn't be collecting satellite images after the program was over. Um, and uh, as a result, while the program itself lasted for two years, between the average duration between baseline and end line for our satellite images is a year and a half. So any, any effects that I, that I show uh, are in a one and a half year window. Um, and then 
an end line survey was, 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 was carried out before, before, the project, before the project finished. And any, any questions kind of on, the, on this rollout? Yes, please. Did you have any information on the age of the forest stands? Like, for instance, someone had been enrolled and they had cut all their wood down 10 years earlier, and they're only in 10 years into regrowth. Would you have known that? Uh, I would not have. The, uh, the, 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 the local organization would have. And, and may I ask why is that, and why is that important for the? Well, if it takes 40 years for your forest to grow back, and you cut it down 20 years ago, then of course you're going to take a payment for a couple of years because you weren't going to cut it anyway. And so um, that's really different than um, if they're all ready to cut. So that's, I guess, what occurs to me. Yeah. Um, no, so that's, you, know, you, you raise a very important point, which is um, a, a big question in, uh, in, 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 in PES schemes, but in any kind of conditional cash transfer program, is this question of additionality. Uh, if people are anyways planning to, in this case, comply with the terms of the contract, uh, then we're not adding, we're, not, we're giving them payments, but we're not adding anything, in this case, you know, reducing deforestation. Uh, or if it's a, you know, a, a conditional cash transfer program encouraging uh, parents to send their children to school. Uh, perhaps many of these parents would have anyways sent their children to school, and so there's very little additionality. So this question of additionality is, a, is an essential one, and, and we'll be able to you know, uh, see if we, if, a, if there is no additionality, then we shouldn't see any impacts of uh, of this program on on reducing deforestation. Another very important question is uh, spillover. So maybe additionality is not a concern, uh, but perhaps people just switch, you know, stop cutting their forest, and move to their neighbors. Uh, and, and of course, that, you know, that, that's a real, a real possibility. We'll also look at uh, explore spillovers. So what are the, what are the program details? Um, so the overall program itself was funded by the Global Environment Facility uh, through a grant to the Ugandan government, and, and they subcontracted to this organization called CSWCT. And the, follow -up, the, the contract had the following terms. So first of all, uh, they agreed not to cut down mature trees. And so mature trees were actually defined by uh, uh, being 10 to uh, 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 50 centimeters at diameter at, at, at breast height. They were allowed to cut down some trees, some mature trees that were bigger than those. Uh, and so that was captured in, in a contract. As I mentioned, uh, the monitoring was done by these community monitors that will go around on bicycles approximately once, once per month. Uh, the payment, 28 US dollars per hectare uh, of, of natural forest per year, if you comply. There was also, also a rule that you must enroll all of your forest. Um, you can withdraw. So you're, you know, at any point in time, you're, you're free to cut down your forest, uh, at least as far as the, the organization is concerned. I mean, on, on the contract, you simply don't get paid. So there are no, there are no penalties of, of not complying. It was completely voluntary. Um, and because it's completely voluntary, you know, in a in a in a theoretical world, you would then also expect everyone to to sign up. That would give you some option value. Uh, and um, there was a small component on on reforestation where you could get a little bit of extra money if you planted planted seedlings, and that uh, that component actually had quite mixed mixed success. And in fact, we were discussing that that earlier as well. Predicted the in, in the first year, if you look at the, at the information, most of the seedlings died. They were more successful in, 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 in the second year. Um, and so how did, they, how did they mobilize these private forest owners? Well, in each of the villages, the organization uh, 
sent a representative and they had meetings to mark the program. Uh, they signed the contract and then the monitoring took place and they received the annual cash payments if they, if they complied. And just to, to foreshadow, um, about 80% of the payments, about 80% of the possible payments were paid out. Yeah, so the compliance rate in that sense, among those who signed up, compliance was about, about 80%. If I live in a treated village, can I go to an untreated village to run an or farm? Uh, uh, yes, if you, you are welcome to do, the co this is the contract, this is the only thing that the, that the contract specifies. If you, if you were, uh, also if you were, and, and, and what was important is that these were private forest plots in the treated villages. There are a few examples, so we actually have a couple of private forest owners who lived in control villages, yeah? who had their primary residence in control villages, but had a plot of land in their treatment villages, and they signed up to, to the program. Um, because the assignment was based on the village and not based on your, on your, on your place of residence. Yeah. And so the cash payments are always at the end of the year? Cash payments are always at the end, yeah. And you didn't have to do anything. You had to just not do stuff. You just had to not not do stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So cuz cuz I mean I'm thinking about the kind of the trust factor because you couldn't it's it's easy for them to be if it doesn't cost them much to not clear the trees with the chance of getting paid at the end of the year then that's fine but if they had to do something and get paid at the end of the year I'm just thinking it would be There'd be a lot more trust involved there. Uh, they didn't. They didn't have to do anything. Uh, in fact, they were. They were asked not to do anything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, please. If you didn't comply in the first year, were you still able to stay in the program and decide to comply the second year, or was that it? Um, uh, no. If if you um, if you so you could. There was an option that you partially complied, in which case. You simply did not did not receive the program. But if you cut down your forest in the first year, then you know you would you could not get get a payment in, in, in the second year. You have nothing left. And you have nothing left. Yeah. Uh, and there was so there was kind of a lower threshold on at some point, but they allowed for some uh, uh, some noise on the margin. But basically, if you made a significant breach of this contract, then then you were out. Yeah. But so, and the some noise on the margin is that that's not by the contract itself, but that's what we see in practice when we look at the admin data. Uh, so, you know, I, it's, you know this better than, than, than I do, but it's probably also somewhat of a, 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 a subjectivity. Uh, and so someone may have said, well, you know, this tree, you know, really I thought we agreed that I could actually cut this tree and, 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 and my son was sick, and so, uh, give me some slack, and then so on the margin we see we see those. Uh, but you know, compliance was on the whole compliance among those who who signed up. Compliance was eighty percent. Mm -hmm. Eighty percent of the payments were 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 were, were made. Um, so the data, three sets of data. I, I I highlighted them: the satellite data, the household survey, and both of these were done at baseline and at end line. Um, and then we also had data on the administrative data that the organization itself collected and, and, and shared with us. For the satellite images, um, so we used high resolution uh, uh, satellite images from QuickBird, and they cost, if I remember correctly, 23 US dollars per square kilometers. Uh, Altogether, this area was over 2,000 2, square kilometers. Uh, hence, the amount per, per wave uh, was about $56,000. Um, it's, uh, the, the resolution is very, very high, uh, very high 2.4 meters. Um, and so that also affected the image analysis where we use object-based object image analysis uh, because the pixel itself can be can be smaller than, say, the crown, the crown of a tree. Um, and if you compare that with, with Landsat, 
uh, and it's uh, 2.4 versus versus 30 meters. I think back on 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 on, on your paper, we're we'll working. <laughs> 100, yeah. 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 Uh, and so, as I mentioned, you know, the it's not the case that one picture covers the the entire the entire area. The satellite flies over, and so we had bands of of, of images, uh, six or seven, and they were mostly taken in April, May. But as I mentioned, as a result of the rainy season, uh, you know, there were a few images at baseline that were that were collected uh, in November and December. And so we do some robustness checks to to uh, see if the results are affected by that. Here's an example uh, where you see these two, these two images. Um, the remote sensing analysis was done at Stanford and using this object-based image uh, analysis where first you segment the image into, into polygons, into objects, uh, and then you classify, classify the objects. Uh, in our case, we were looking for, uh, and it has to be mutually exclusive, and, and uh, uh, for three types. One is cloud, three, two was uh, a tree cover, and, and three was non non tree cover. So these were these were the three you know, the three objects that we were that we were interested in. Um, the way we did the uh, um, the classification itself is that we also used. Ground truthing by so local organization Nahi uh, went out and they were given 440 uh, uh, GPS points in this landscape to uh, measure on the ground what was there, and so that information was fed into uh, into the computer essentially, and then uh, at least for part of these points, and then we could also verify. Now, applying then the algorithm, the objects to part of the 440 plots that were not used to feed into the system to see if it was accurate. Um, yes, please. What was the smallest um, stand of tree or, or land ownership area that you were dealing with? So, um, how much land? Yes, I'll, I'll, in, in a moment I'll show the, some of the summary statistics about for, for each landowner, but just on uh, the average was about, was about 10 hectares with about 2 hectares of, of natural forest land in it. Uh, the medium was about half of that. Uh, and, th and there were some with, with, with really small, small plots. So that's why you needed all this spatial resolution, because if the... If the uh, if the areas that, that were owned were larger, you, you wouldn't need quick bird resolution to get the information you wanted to get, necessarily. I mean, it wouldn't be overkill unless the, the actual land areas themselves were small and you were trying to resolve landowner by landowner. I mean, yes, if, 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 if the... Well, so two things. So one is, you know, there's a... If, if the forests were very large, yeah, then you might, you might get away with a much lower resolution. On the other hand, um, there is a risk that, in the, if, even if the, forest, if the forest were very large, there is the risk that the private forest owners selectively cut inside the forest. And so, so they may not cut a whole you know, part of the forest and then with a, uh, even with a, a small resolution, you would, you would pick it up. But they may you know, take a tree here and there, and if we have uh, Landsat images, we, we would never know. Uh, so that's. And so that's another reason if why. If you had a greenness index, you wouldn't know. Would you? You wouldn't know? Mm -hmm. Not unless you cut a lot. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um. But so how, who got to say how much forest each of the owners owned? Did they get to say or did you measure it with your satellite imagery? Oh, yeah, okay. Okay. Uh, okay. yeah. In fact, who, who got to say it? In the end, there was an agreement between the local organization, CSWCT, and the private forest owner. So they, uh, they probably walked around. They said, "Well, we have we have self-reported data as well, but no, and we find that that's quite noisy." Um, but they they probably walked around uh, and said, "Okay, we have this much," 
and then they, they have to make an assessment. Uh, yes, please. So, so you want the cliff bird basically so you can watch individual trees. Yes. Right. So what happens if the tree falls over? Well. Does that count as non-compliance? Nobody hears. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but the payments are not based on the satellite imagery. No, no, no. The payments are not based on the satellite images. The payments are based solely on the discussion between the community monitors. And <coughs> so, if the, if the tree falls, and I, if I were a community monitor, and <coughs> Andrew says my tree fell, and I would say, well, let, let, let's go visit the tree and see. You know, is, are there any signs that it actually fell? Or <laughs> you know, I see still here a stump, and you seem to have cut it. Uh, you know, so, so it's based on that type of discussion. Yeah, so the satellite images were only used by us, not by, not by the program, program itself. Yes, what, please. What was the categorical error you got on those? On? Uh, for forests, non-forests, for objects. I, I don't know the answer. I would I have to ask Eric. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, one more question. Yeah, no, go ahead. And then, yeah. If I had to guess, you, you, you could do pretty well on forest on forest with conversion. I'm trying to be wrong, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't think there'd be much problem. Yeah, but with the secondary growth. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, there's going to be some. Trees grow fast in the tropics. And ultimately, what we're interested in is the, is the difference between between the treatment and, 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 and the control villages. So uh, to the extent that there is a random noise there, um, that's OK for the purposes of the, of the evaluation. Um, and then you had a question? Yeah, yeah you said so. You said it was okay. part of the agreement was they could cut trees down that were over a certain size. Yeah, so they could, they could have an agreement where um, a, a limited number could be identified. OK, we'd like to cut this big tree yep. uh, and, and but there were limits on how how, how many they they were allowed to cut and I guess my question is just was that tended to be a very small number per hectare or yes yeah okay yeah um, why did you allow them to cut some very large trees I mean I didn't allow anyone to do anything <laughs> <laughs> and, and I mean it's very, very important so this was the way this 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 uh, this contract was designed by a number of CSWCT consulted with a number of other local organizations that are active active in this space. So they, they come to this. If you ask me why did they why did they do that in the end, um, was that given the um, we saw earlier that twenty five percent reported uh, cutting a tree for for emergency situations, uh, and I think what they wanted to create is some some breathing space on the margin to allow for extreme situations uh, and, 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 and have that the reason that, they, that, this, that this was permitted by, not, it, as long as that was specified in, 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 in the contract. Um, yeah, then to your, to your other question, so how, uh, what is the information that we, that we use? So uh, we used boundaries to create Observations. Effectively, in the analysis, we use two types of observations. One is at the level of the private forest owner, the PFO, um, where we have information on, on forest cover, both at baseline and at end line. Um, and we also calculate the same thing at the village level. And so we actually have village boundaries. And we see, now with the satellite image, the entire village and so we can look at the entire village and ask the question, what is the forest cover in this entire village? So not just across the private forest owners that were there, but you know, a full picture, picture of the village. The measure that we used at the, uh, at the level of the private forest owners is this one there. So a circle that was twice the self-reported area. Now, I'll motivate it, like, why did we do this? Uh, just to highlight that even if you don't believe in this measure, that we did do robustness checks with other size circles, and the results are robust to, to this. Why, why two times the size of the self-reported land area? Um, is that, uh, imagine 
uh, that this is the, the GPS point of the house itself. Uh, the land is not a perfect circle around, around this house. So we wanted to kind of err on the safe side and make sure that uh, we choose a circle that will likely, in all likelihood, capture, capture, this, uh, uh, capture this land. We also use smaller circles, so one, one times the size of the self-reported land, but that's likely to exclude some, some parts. We also use bigger circles, uh, three times, and, and uh, we find that the results actually don't, they, they change in, in, in predictable directions, but they continue to be significant. Um, on the household survey, so we surveyed uh, just over, over 1,100 private forest owners at baseline, and for 1,099, we were able to collect the, the GPS data. Um, in, in some cases, people refused to provide the GPS data. Uh, in other cases, there were also a number of cases where actually the GPS itself malfunctioned. Um, this compares with more people that were identified in the census. Uh, so uh, nearly, nearly, 15, uh, nearly 1,500. And, and, but in the census, remember in the census, it wasn't individuals that were identified, but rather how many private forest owners are in this village through a village meeting. Uh, so it's not, you know, it's not a surprise that some, that that list may have been off and that some people could not be, could, could not be found. At Endline, we were able to resurvey uh, 93, 93%. We do actually see that there are some, um, uh, that the attrition is higher in the treatment group, uh, and, and, and particularly among those who did not take up the program. So in the treatment group, among those who did not take up the program, fewer respondents uh, responded um, than those who did take up the program. And so when we look at the results, we uh, also look, calculate lead bounds to adjust for, to basically align the attrition between control and treatment, and then look at upper bounds and lower bound effects. Um, some, let me just, and I'm looking at the, at, 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 at the time here as well, so let me just highlight some key, key characteristics. As I mentioned, about 10 hectares on average, about two, two hectares on average of forest land in each of these places. Uh, some common characteristics here. So disputes with neighbors, 20%, 16% rented land, 10% was involved in, a, in an environmental program. The vast majority, more than 50, uh, vast majority, the majority, more than 50% agree that deforestation affects the community. Um, there is a small minority that says uh, you need to damage the environment to improve your life. Uh, and we see the take up of the program is smaller among, among this group. Uh, yeah, so let me, let me get to the results. So this is the, the, kind of the, basic, the basic estimation that we repeat throughout the paper. So it's an intent, an intent to treat analysis. So basically, we take, regardless of whether or not you take up the program, uh, if you're in the treatment group, uh, you get assigned one. And if you're in the control group, in, the, in one of the control villages, you get assigned zero. Uh, and so our intent to treat parameter of interest is this, is this beta, beta here. We also uh, control for uh, baseline tree coverage and uh, control for the stratification variables that were used, like the sub-county fixed effects and these four variables that were used to, uh, to balance. In uh, some of the specifications, we also control for uh, using the Landsat information that's available for 1990 and uh, 2010 photosynthetic information uh, on vegetation. Because the assignment is done by village, we cluster the standard errors, uh, and in uh, in, in, in our main specifications, we also weigh the observations by the percent of the data um, within the circle that was cloud-free. So you could have a, a circle for an observation. On average, I believe about 79% of, 
was cloud-free. Uh, but that varied. So in some cases, uh, there were actually, I think, about 90 observations where it was fully clouded, either at baseline or at endline, and that would drop. That We treat that as a missing observation. Um, in other cases, it will be small. In other cases, we have full coverage. So we weigh each observation by the percentage of, of, of cloud cover. We do a robustness check to see if that matters. It actually doesn't really, doesn't really affect the results in, in, a, in a meaningful way. Um, so what are the results? Well, first, take up is actually quite low. Um, 30, 32% that you see that you see here. Um, and so what is driving the reason for, for this low take up? Well, the most important reason it seems to be a very mundane one, uh, which is that two thirds uh, mentioned that they were unaware that this program was even in existence. Uh, we had some discussion this morning about uh, uh, various interpretations of, of what unaware <laughs> means. Uh, but uh, they... Um, this was an endline. Uh, this was a deadline, yes, yeah. This, this is information at the deadline. But um, didn't you offer them like, a contract <laughs> program? Uh, so what CSWCT would do is they, they, came, they came to these villages, not organized the meeting. They, they were given a list of the treatment villages and announced this program. Uh, they didn't offer to individual people. Well, they offered to individual people who showed up at their meetings. Uh, I see. Uh, so, so this is not... So this low uptake is not of the people who showed up at the meetings. No, this low uptake is, yeah. For the whole village. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Do you yeah. know who showed up at the meetings? Can you estimate the uptake rate of the people who showed up at the meetings? Uh, no, I don't think they actually collected these records. Okay. Yeah. Um, now, what are some other reasons? Well, you see them, you see them here. So fear of, 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 of land grabbing. They're all smaller, much smaller percentages. Uh, they deemed ineligible, they didn't know how to sign up, and uh, there was also a group that found, found the contract uh, too complicated. Um, and yeah, and we don't actually see that uh, take up is, is correlated with the counterfactual deforestation. So when we, uh, when we look at the um, uh, uh, predict who, who takes up, uh, well, when we look at take up and look uh, and we predict deforestation in the control, uh, apply that to the treatment group. Uh, what, what would the treatment group have deforested? And we use a, uh, the, uh, using uh, baseline characteristics. We don't actually find that there are any, that that correlates the prediction of, of, <coughs> of their deforestation behavior is not correlated with, with take up. And, and probably the reason is simply that it's not a surprise that many people are not. We're not, we're not aware, and we wouldn't expect there to be you know, background characteristics that are um, uh, affected with, with, with take up. So here, kind of the main effects of the paper, uh, before time is over. We find that deforestation, that forest cover, is about a quarter of a hectare higher in the treatment villages than it is in <coughs> Per, PF, per private forest owner. Um, and so this, again, this is an intent to treat uh, estimate. So the average treatment PFO has a quarter of a hectare more forest standing on, on, on this land uh, when we come uh, with, with the end line, which on average was a year and a half into, into the program. And so for now, if you would, so you can scale this, you know, what would that, so in practice, what does that kind of mean uh, for, because only 30% actually took up. So you could divide this number by, by 30% to get a sense of you know, how much higher it is in the specific, uh, in, in those who actually took up the program. What's the difference between column one and column two? Uh, that the control variables, particularly the uh, controlling for the photosynthetic information before the start of the program is is here but not is, is not here but is here yeah just control yes please what is the market for timber products like are there local markets where the control villages could be affected by the price like if, if these villages reduce their output of forest products where the control villages are now benefiting by higher 
right? Yeah, so, so that's, in, in theory, that's an option. I mean, there are local markets there, and, and we'll look in, in a moment, I'll show you uh, kind of robustness checks that we, that we see. If, do we see any evidence? Do we see any evidence of shifting uh, towards, towards the controls? Because uh, that could be, you know, in, in, in theory, perhaps it's higher in the treatment because everybody now is cutting in the, in the control villages. So that's a, that's, a real, that's a real risk. And so we do some robustness checks to see if, do we find any evidence of that. Um, so we find, you know, uh, large effect sizes. And just to give you a sense of what does this quarter of a hectare on average mean, we see a reduction of about 0 0.35 hectares in forest cover in the control group between baseline and end line. So in the control group, it goes down by 0 0.35. And, and what, what this figure says that in the, in the treatment villages, it's 0 0.25 now boosted. So this effect size actually now indicates that uh, more than half of the deforestation that is happening in, in the control villages is stopped by, by this program. Um, which in a way is surprising because take up is 31%. Yeah? So if if there was uniform if there was uniform deforestation happening across all the private forest owners, then we would expect the effect size to be 31 uh, percent. So it raises a question: What is what is happening here? Um, uh, and it could be that you know, maybe uh, the program affected norms and behaviors among those who are who did not sign up but live in the treatment villages. So they did not sign up for the program. But they see their neighbors not cutting, uh, you know, and maybe this this village monitor who is bicycling around. Uh, stops and says, you know, by the way, maybe you shouldn't cut either. Uh, these things could, could be happening. Uh, it could also be the case that the distribution is not uniform, which in fact we find some evidence for, uh, and that the program is particularly effective, that take up is, is higher among those who are most at risk of cutting down their forest. And so uh, we actually get exactly the people uh, sign up that we that we'd want to sign up. Uh, and that they comply. You see, <laughs> that's just why would that be? That, well, that's a good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's why research is fun. You know? <laughs> yes, please. So, uh, could this not also be that the people in the treated villages are going to farm newly cleared land in the untreated villages? If you all rent land, and you told me you could walk back and forth from one or the other. It, it could be the case that, yeah, that, that we have very large program effects because simply uh, they were boosted a bit and they were going down. That, that's, uh, from, from this information, uh, we can't uh, reject that. Yeah. Uh -huh. We do some robustness checks. So no weighting. Uh, if we look at proportion instead of levels, if we drop outliers, uh, if we use different types of, 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 of land circles, uh, or drop the cases where the baseline image was done after the, after the lottery. Uh, and you know, this, the size of the effect changes a little bit, but it remains substantial and, and, and significant. And, and it goes in, in the direction that you would hope it to go. So for example, when we drop the, uh, the, the, the where the baseline was done after the observations, where the baseline or satellite image was done after the lottery, that the effect size goes up, goes up a bit in the remaining sample. Um, shifting of deforestation and and and, and spillovers. Um, so within, you know, within the, the results that I just showed, it already accounts for a number of, of different shifts. So shifts where they move just outside of their land. You know, we we find that the effect size, in fact, the effect size is still large when we take a size three times as big. Mm -hmm. When they, they could have an agreement with other, now most likely actually agreement would not be that they go to other villages, but they go to private forest owners who did not sign up for the program in the same village, and they don't have to walk so far. Um, 
But that it, we account for that because of this intention, intention to treat. However, we, uh, uh, it is possible that there is changes now outside of these outside of these circles. And so, for that reason, we look at tree cover at the at the entire village level. And so here, that's why you see the number of observations. So these are the 121 villages now. Uh, and of course, it's a smaller sample size, so it's not as significant. But we see that in the treated villages, relative to the control villages, forest cover goes up by uh, nearly five, five hectares. And so, and how does that compare to this point estimate of, 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 of 0 0.27 that we found of hectares? Well, there are on average about 12 private forest owners. So 12 times this number is three point something, so it's actually slightly lower than what we see, what we see here. Uh, so in other words, we don't see evidence of shifting uh, within, within the village. Um, what about spillovers outside the village? So we look at a number of, uh, we, we do a number of estimations where we see if uh, uh, private forest owners or villages that are close, for example, to government reserves, so we using the distance, or if they are next to government reserves, do we see any evidence of, um, uh, of, of spillovers there? And, 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 and we don't. We also don't see that the villages that in the control group that are close to treatment group villages, because there you might think that there are spillovers, we don't see evidence that these that deforestation is, is, is uh, significantly correlated with distance to, uh, to the treatment villages. So basically, based on the information that we have here, we don't find evidence of these spillovers uh, to, the, to the control group. Now, and the point that, uh, uh, that, that you raised earlier in, in, in our discussion is that, the, of course, uh, you have to think about the general equilibrium effects if this program were scaled up. Um, because then you, uh, where, where, do, where do people's demand for the wood go? Um, and you know, then there's some, you, you wouldn't expect the, the effects to be as big. I mean, of course, it all depends on the, the, uh, the elasticity for, uh, for, for timber, but you, know, you probably see prices rise, uh, and, uh, but some uh, increased cutting in the other areas. Yeah, five minutes. Five minutes, yes please. Did the experiment end after two years, the paint, all payments end after two years? Yeah. And they knew that ahead of time? Yes. Have you gone <laughs> back after the fact to see if they just then cut down the wood after? Uh, not yet, but we're raising funding for okay. that. Because <laughs> yeah. yeah. if, if you have a, a source of income that just increases in value as you let it grow, then waiting a couple of years would be totally advent. It may be of no cost to you. So this is just bonus money. It still has value. It still has value because you delay from a, from a social point of view. Um, uh, okay, well, we, can, we can talk about that later. But. Yeah, no, well, in fact, we'll talk about it now, actually. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so then, um, in terms of expectations, just to finish this, we don't see that people's expectations about the program continuing or not. So we asked at the endline survey, now, what, were, what, what were your expectations? Or what are your expectations about this program continuing? Um, we don't see that that, and we see variation across that. Within, within our sample, and that variation is not correlated with, uh, uh, with, with, with deforestation huh? uh, at the expectation level. So, so beliefs do not seem to affect deforestation. Heterogeneity and treatment effects, basically to summarize what we, uh, uh, so we did this thought experiment of in the control sample, what are the baseline characteristics that predict deforestation, uh, the difference in forest between uh, end line and, and, and baseline. So then we get a, you know, a number of baseline characteristics that are good predictors. We apply that model to predict the counterfactual deforestation in our, in our treatment sample, uh, to predict what deforestation would have looked like. Uh, and we find that that variable uh, is, um, 
uh, not correlated uh, with the predicted counterfactual deforestation, but we do find that it's that's here uh, predicts conditional on um, it, it, it predicts the uh, change in tree cover in in the treatment group. So those who uh, basically the effect is higher for those who would have cut more trees, at least predicted to do so. The avoided deforestation is higher. In terms of the, um, uh, the end line surveys, so here, um, I'll, I'll just go through them. Uh, so let me just verbally you know, walk you through them. So what, what do we find? We find very few effects on uh, social economic indicators. Um, you know, which is consistent with the idea that the payment was, was relatively small um, and you know, offset, uh, they either would have cut a tree or would have received, received this payment. Um, we do see on a number of characteristics that um, uh, they reduce access, it seems that they reduce access to their land by, by neighbors. Um, so that does raise a question of does this payment, certainly this program, well, did no harm to, to the participants, but uh, may have reduced access to neighbors. There's a, there, there might be a question of equity here, particularly because the forest owners tend to be better off, at least anecdotally, than, than, than the rest of the community members. Um, and, you know, we see, and that, that is, should be a surprise, that self-reported tree cutting is higher in the treatment communities, fortunately. Then, just in terms of the, the cost-benefit analysis, um, so we have an estimate of the number of, of the amount of metric tons uh, of, of CO2 that is captured in, in this area. Um, uh, that, that data is, 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 is available. And that, that allows us to basically do this, this cost-benefit cost analysis. So how much, how much carbon is being delayed? How much carbon is being delayed by this program of, 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 of two years? Uh, and then you have to make some assumptions about what happens after two years. Do they, you know, the program ends and they cut all the trees, just like they, they immediately catch up with the controls, or you know, they continue their behavior or something in, something in between? Um, we have kind of a middle of the round estimate and, and use uh, the statistic from the, the social cost of carbon right, by the EPA, which is about permanently delaying uh, the net present value of permanently averting a ton of CO2 is $39. Here we're not doing it permanently, but over the shorter period of time. So you can calculate the net present value of, 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 of that. And so what comes, what comes out of it is that the CO2 benefit in this case under a number of different assumptions that you know, we're trying to be realistic and, and in some cases conservative, the benefit outweighs the cost of the program. So the benefit using the social cost of, of averted carbon is in this case $1.11 and the program cost is 0 0.57. So it's a, uh, and, and, and here's a summary of that. And so for a range of different different assumptions, you basically see that the benefits uh, here, except for, for this one here, uh, the, the, the benefits outweigh the cost. And that compares favorably with a number of other programs here in the US uh, that you see here, the cash for clunkers, to the conservation reserve program where the costs are all higher, the program costs are all higher than and the benefit. Um, and then there are some other benefits. Biodiversity, we talked about it. Um, uh, potential benefits for the water table. And uh, this effectively is a, a, even though within the communities, this may be regressive, you know, supporting the richer ones. At an global level, the payments went from rich countries to poor countries. Um, And I think I'm anyways out of time. Yes. So, 
All right, well, why don't we uh, go upstairs and eat and drink and be merry and ask him questions there. So let's get it.